Welcome to chapter five of Soil Science and Management. And today we're going to talk about the life in the soil. And this is actually a pretty interesting topic because we're going to go over and discuss all of the living organisms that happen or happen to be living in the soil and how they're utilized by the soil and, and actually by the plants to create these symbiotic relationships throughout throughout all of the soil. Um, today you're going to learn about the food web and the carbon cycle and, and just all of the other things that are happening within the soil that bring it to life. Um, so today, like I said, we're going to be discussing the carbon cycle. We're going to be discussing the soil food web. We're going to understand what soil organisms exist in the soil. We're going to understand which are important and why. And then we're going to talk about how to promote healthy populations of these beneficial soil organisms. So to start out in saying that uh, a soil is teeming with life would be an understatement. Don't need to read all these facts for you, but in one teaspoon of soil, you can create all kinds of, uh, find all kinds of living organisms, small, very small organisms, and all of these, um, algae and fungi and bacteria, they all have a role. And they all are doing things within the soil to help or or promote or even to, to take away nutrients. Uh, so many of these different organisms are either creating nutrients or using nutrients or changing nutrients into another thing. So there's always something going on underneath your feet. Whenever you're walking around, there's always things down there changing other things into new things. So when we talk about this, we're going to start with the uh, the food chain or the food web. And, and you guys, I'm sure, have heard about this. This is goes base, basically back to uh, the herbivores, the carnivores, uh, and the carbon cycle this is basically the the antithesis of the carbon cycle it's how carbon is turned into a food that food is then consumed by by something and then and it's consumed again and again and then the top of the food chain animal will die and the microorganisms will convert that animal back into nutrients that go back into plants. When we look at the different things in the food chain, we have the primary producers and consumers. We have the secondary consumers. We have the detritus. We have the decomposers. We have the organic matter. And then we have the humus. So if we look at this as a, as a cycle, the producers are what take the carbon and turn it into food. So there's only one thing in the world that can make its own food, and that's plants. Plants are considered the producers because they are able to take the carbon out of the sky and out of the ground and turn it into sugar. Uh, those plants then create this glucose. They put it into fruits and vegetables, leaves, all of the different parts of the plant. The next part of the food chain or carbon cycle is the herbivores. They are gonna come by, they're going to eat the different parts of the plant, they're gonna eat the fruits, they're gonna eat the nuts, they're going to consume the carbon that is within this plant and they're going to turn this carbon into meat. You then come and have predators or carnivores who will eat the herbivores and will take the carbon that was originally part of the plant that became part of the herbivore and it will turn it into energy for the carnivore. As that, that animal dies, the parasites will then turn the carnivore back into nutrients that can uh, be utilized back in the soil. And so this is where we come back and we get the organic matter and the humus back into the soil from these microorganisms, these bacterias, these parasites are converting all of the carbon within those plants into nutrients that these plants can then retake up. And so you'll end up back at the beginning of the cycle where the 
plants are then producing the carbon all over again using the nutrients that are in the soil. When we talk about this, we have the microflora and the microfauna. So the microflora are usually these smaller one-celled organisms, bacteria, fungus, acetomites, and algae. And then you have the microfauna, which are your protozoa or more animal-like bacteria, not bacteria, not bacteria, but animal-like organisms that will, all of these, all of these, these different types of organisms are all doing the same thing. They're all breaking down different portions of things in the soil to convert them into other materials that plants and animals can use. So if we're gonna look at the distribution of these microorganisms within the soil, you have what is called the rhizosphere. And it is usually an area that is about one to two millimeters from the plant roots. So what ends up happening is these plants and these microorganisms start to build these symbiotic relationships. We're going to discuss them in labs and in future lectures, but there are something called the mycorrhizos, mycorrhizal fungus. So you'll see the rhizosphere, which is the area around a plant, also the plant roots, that's the rhizo meaning root, sphere meaning the area around the root. And then myco means fungus, so you'll actually have the, the literal translation of mycorrhizae is fungus roots, and you start to have these relationships. These funguses will bring water and nutrients closer to the plants, and then the plants will give the sugars back to the mycorrhizae so that they can sustain themselves and live off of those sugars. We also have nutrient cycling, and this is going to be different types of uh, materials that are either in the, in the air or in the ground, and they are being converted and churned into different materials that plants can use. So this will be nitrogen fixation. We'll, we'll talk about uh, different types of, of elements that need to be fixed and utilized so uh, the plants have access to them. So here we go, nitrogen fixation. This is the process of converting nitrogen gas to ammonium, and then ultimately turning that ammonium into nitri uh, nitrate so that the plants can use it. Plants can use nitrogen in two forms. It can be used both as ammonium and as nitrate. These are the two different uh, 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 forms of this nitrogen molecule that plants can use and nitrogen being one of the macronutrients it does become important when we look at nitrogen fixation this is done mostly by these leguminous plants um, i.e beans are one of the most common so green beans kidney beans all the different bean families will actually remove the 90 or the, excuse me the the nitrogen from the air and it will bring it down into the soil and convert it into these ammonium ions so that plants can use it. Uh, <clears throat> the, the bean plant itself actually will leave behind this nitrogen in the soil so that it has access to it. Some people in the class may understand crop rotations and typically when you are rotating a crop, you are rotating two years of a non-leguminous plant and then one year of a leguminous plant so that you can re reintroduce nitrogen back into the soil. So the beans are converting more nitrogen than they're using in these soils. After we have uh, this nitrogen that is fixed by the, or excuse me, nitrogen is then fixed into the nitrate by soil microbes and nitrate is a better used uh, nutrient in the soil than the ammonium. And this is called mineralization. And this is like decaying these different materials down into a smaller and smaller, smaller object. So nitrification and denitrification, this is what I was just talking about. Nitrification is the oxidid oxidation process of the ammonium uh, Adam, and it's pretty simple. When you look at oxidation, we've talked about this a little bit, but anytime you are adding an oxygen uh, 
uh, molecule to to an to another element, you are then oxidizing it, and you are typically left with whatever material you started with and oxygen. In this case, you started with NH4, which is the ammonium um, ammonium ion, and you are removing those hydrogens. You're oxidizing those away, and you're going to be left with nitrate, which is NO3. So that is how you're changing this these ions. You're breaking down the bonds. You're converting them into as something else. Now we have denitrification, and that is going to be the completion of the nitrogen cycle. And so when you complete the nitrogen cycle, those nitrate ions are actually um, uh, almost evaporated out of the soil into nitrogen gas. And this will then filter out of the soil and become part of the air again. So the process goes, you have nitrogen gas, it is converted into ammonium, it is then converted into nitrate, and that nitrate will then circle back out as a, as a nitrogen gas. In the process, there are two different uh, nitrate nitrogen ions that can be used by the plants. There is another process where uh, this nitrification goes uh, further than it needs to, and that creates nitrite, which is NO2. And uh, NO2 is actually toxic for plants. We don't want NO2. And this happens when there is a lack of oxygen in the soil. So when we're talking about the soil aggregation, we want to make sure that we understand that these soil microbes will, will aggregate themselves in different parts of the soil, i.e. those rhizospheres, different areas where other things are being broken down. And when we talk about plant growth production, we've kind of already covered that. This is those interactions, those symbiotic rela relationships between the roots and the microbes. Oh, mycorrhizae. So we talked about mycorrhizae, and this is some of the benefits of those mycorrhizae. So this is a fungi that forms an association with plant roots in the rhizosphere resulting in, and let's just look these over real quick. So improved phosphorus uptake, improved water absorption, improved micronutrient uptake, uptake, extended rootlet lifespan, and improved physical plant condition. So these are all the, the things that a plant will benefit from these mycorrhizae. And you can see that it's very important to have these in there. These will create a, almost a net-like effect inside the soil, and the, the different plant roots will be able to trade nutrients back and forth across the mycorrhizae, kind of like a, a telephone line, so to speak. Now, the mycorrhizae doesn't do this for free. It is there for a reason. And, and like I said before, it's there to, to attach on to some of the sugars that the plant is already creating as part of the photosynthesis process. And, and that is why these mycorrhizae are, are in the soil and, and how they create these symbiotic relationships. So then we talk about uh, rhizobacteria, and these are going to be bacteria that are similar to those mycorrhizae. So remember, mycorrhizae are fungus, but then there are rhizobacteria, and uh, these are root uh, promoting or, or supporting bacteria that are in the in the soil. These are are going to help break down organic matter that's in the soil, so that plants have access to it and can utilize that organic matter as a fertilizer and something that the plants can use to, per, to produce uh, the sugar. We also utilize soil organisms in bioremediation. This is when we uh, find certain different bacterias or fungus that will help break down oils or pesticides or organic wastes. Uh, back in the day, there was DDT and and DDT was a real hard one because it was uh, perpetuated itself in the soil. And we have determined that there are certain bacteria that will eat this DDT and will help remove it from certain areas. Uh, so methane production and absorption. These are other uh, uh, bacteria that will create methane gas. And so these are anaerobic uh, reactions and these are not something that we're going to want to have when we're talking about plant growth. Uh, if you're having methane or swamp gas smelling uh, uh, soil, then you probably don't have soil that is uh, suitable to grow things. And these are going to be an oxygen 
free areas. So there's going to be no oxygen. It's going to be everything but the oxygen in these areas. When we look at these uh, soil organisms that's in the, within the soil, we consider that something called biologic activity, and that is an, an the indicator of uh, of soil quality. If we don't have biological activity within our soil, we don't have a very healthy soil. In fact, we have kind of a dead soil, and it's not only just because there's no living organisms within the soil, it's just there's nothing happening, there's no change, there's no um, nutrients being broken down, being utilized. Something we can do or, or even uh, a natural process that happens is called inoculation. And, and this is when those um, bacteria or organisms are put into the soil and it, it is going to be used to help improve the soil. Uh, you can buy those mycorrhizae fungus at Home Depot or Lowe's and you can sprinkle them in your grass or other, you know, orchard, uh, uh, vegetable garden, anywhere else you'd like to help improve your soil. And you can, you can do this and then it will, it will continue to perpetuate itself as long as those plants are alive. Um, <clears throat> this will help to enhance your soil conditions. It will, it will make the soil more hospitable for uh, plants to grow in these re relationships will start to develop between the fungus and the back and the back uh, and the plants um, <clears throat> one of the important things to, to understand when you are inoculating or trying to improve a, your soil organisms is to ensure that they're continuing to get um, organic material so a lot of uh, soils will have naturally occurring organic material. Uh, sometimes, I, you know, we'll go over some examples. When you're mowing uh, a, a lawn, you don't always want to to catch your clippings and and remove them. It's actually a very good uh, source of potassium to leave them on the on the soil so they can be broken down, and that potassium can be returned into the soil. And uh, those microorganisms will break down that organic material and allow it to be uh, utilized again by those different or, or, uh, plants. So to improve those uh, soil conditions, you want to, you know, reduce your tilling. You want to improve your drainage, minimize your compaction areas, uh, use less pesticides. You want to make sure you're maintaining adequate nutrition levels. Uh, minimize fallowing or, or non-use of the of the soil. So fallowing means when you are growing crops and you decide you don't want to grow a crop that year, that is considered fallowing your field. Uh, <coughs> you want to make sure that you're increasing your habit diversity, habitat diversity, excuse me. And this is basically uh, when we talked earlier about uh, uh, the leg the <laughs> the leguminous plants and you want to rotate those plants in and out you want to uh, maybe intercrop where you're going to plant some of them with the other plants that you have you want to make sure that you are diverse diversifying the landscape so you don't have um, just one type of plant using all the nutrients and you end up with um, a very barren soil and it, and it is uh, doing lots of damage to that soil it's important to make sure we're controlling harmful organisms. Um, we don't want to uh, track in, first of all, we don't want to track in any bad organisms. So uh, it's important if you do know you have um, harmful organisms to uh, sterilize the equipment that you have, ensure that none of that is getting uh, transferred. Uh, again, you want to make sure you're rotating crops so you have different bacterias that are being worked and different uh, materials that are being broken down in the soil. And if you can reduce the amount of, of pesticides that you are using, you will stop the perpetuation of these uh, organisms from uh, becoming immune to those pesticides and you will make sure that you have a stronger soil. 
There are also uh, soil animals. Uh, we talked about the macro fauna, or excuse me, we did not. There are two groups, the macro fauna and the meso fauna. And these are just different size um, ideas. So the macro fauna is to uh, mix and invert soil and create larger soil channels. So this is gonna be uh, your, your worms, your uh, little insects that dig holes. And then the meso fauna, are gonna do the same as that macro fauna, but they're gonna help in the decay process. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna actually take those organic materials and convert them into uh, a fertilizer uh, so again, i.e. worm casings and or other uh, fecal material that is being uh, taken one organic material and converting into something more useful for the plants. So here's some <clears throat> um, ideas for those mesofaunas. You have those nematodes, you have arthropods, and then the macrofauna is going to be earthworms or small mammals. Uh, such as mice or other um, small rodents that can create holes. These are actually beneficial because they're going to help aerate. They're going to help reduce compaction in certain areas. So the summary for the chapter looks like this. We, we talked about the soil uh, food web. We talked about how microisms, microorganisms can be beneficial or detrimental. Uh, make sure you understand the nitrogen cycle make sure you understand how mycorrhizae and other organisms interact with the soil uh, rhizosphere and then <clears throat> make sure you understand uh, what a mesofauna and a macrofauna are for uh, questions that could be potentially on your tests thank you i uh, will see you next time